Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Non-Scripted Ramblings. I'm a Kendall Richardson, thanks so much for joining me. I'm here today to discuss my thoughts and feelings and my review in general of episode 6 of What If, uh, which is titled What If Killmonger Rescued Tony Stark? Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I guess overall, initially, I gotta say this isn't one of my favorite episodes. Um, it just ended super abruptly. <laughs> I didn't really like the ending. I, I really do feel like they needed, uh, the show needed like an extra 10 minutes, five or 10 minutes. Um, I'm starting to feel that some of these episodes are maybe kind of restricted or restrained by their half an hour runtime. Uh, in terms of the pacing, in terms of the story that they're trying to tell, because it really did feel like where it ends, and I'll just get, to, I'll just discuss it now because it's my biggest nitpick, but where it ends with like Shuri and Pepper realizing, you know, both, well, both of them have realized already that Killmonger's up to no good and he needs to be stopped, so they team up to take him down. Um, but then we just flash to, you know, the Watcher giving his, you know, um, kind of heartbreaking narration about heroes never die, you know, etc. which is really emotional because I just can't help but think of Chadwick when I hear those words, but, um, but it just cut to that, like, I know it's obviously implied that they get together and stop him, maybe, but we don't, we don't know. I mean, there's rumours that he'll appear in this big crossover episode that might be happening at some point soon. Um... I don't know, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I just, I just, it was so abrupt because it just really felt like it was. Because I want, I don't know. Maybe it was just me thinking of like, you know, because our story is, you know, we see the 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 main character kind of go through it, and then if they're the bad guy, they get taken down. Generally, I don't know. The bad guys always get taken down, but I suppose because it's Killmonger's story more than it is Tony Stark's story, it stands to reason that he would come on top victorious because it's 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 his show in this case so that kind of makes sense but i was just i don't know the way it was building and the fact that shuri and um shuri and pepper Potts were like you know let's take him down i just it felt like we were about to go into oh let's do this but then it never happened and i was like oh, okay this is a bit yeah unfortunate so it was super abrupt the way it ended um but that's that's me. Um, yeah, I don't know what else I can say in terms of my criticisms of the episode because I did like I did enjoy it. Like it, it's still entertaining. Um, it's not a bad episode by any means. I just uh, compared to some of the others, like the Doctor Strange one, um, which is still the one to beat, guys. <laughs> it's still the one, um, and uh, <laughs> which I never thought I'd say the Doctor Strange episode was the best one. Um, <laughs> uh, um, some shade on Doctor Strange for some reason. Uh, and then, yes, yeah, Chichala's uh, episode of Star Lord, episode two, is right behind that. So, um, yeah, this episode didn't touch either of those anywhere near uh, for my money. Um, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people that are really loving this one because, I mean, look, it's arguable that Killmonger is one of the best villains in the MCU, um, if you know, he's definitely top three because you've got Thanos, you've got Loki, you've got Killmonger. Some people put Killmonger above all, both of them, but I, I can't. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's amazing. He's such a good villain, but um, but yeah, no, I'm I'm too biased to put him ahead of Loki, so that's that's on me. But um, but no, he's a fantastic villain and a fantastic character. Um, and was one of the best parts of the Black Panther movie. I mean, there's so many great parts about the Black Panther film in general. Um, and yeah, and Michael B. Jordan's performance in that is just excellent, um, beyond excellent. And he continues that here um, with his voice acting as Killmonger. Uh, it does a really good job. And um, yeah, I, I, it, it's nice to have a Killmonger story again, especially because you know, I was sad that he died at the end of Black Panther because he, you know, he's such a good character. It's just such a shame to have his story end so, you know, after one movie because, you know, people were raving about him afterwards. But I understand why they did what they did. His storytelling and all of that makes sense. 
Um, so it's nice to kind of give him an opportunity to come back in a way um, and to do a different take on the character almost. Very similar, but different. I think the Black Panther film did him much better. Um, if, you're, if you ask me, I feel like this episode kind of plays him more as a villain, I guess. But I suppose they don't have enough time to really go into him too deeply as a character. Um, whereas the Black Panther film, you got to spend a bunch of time with Killmonger to find out his motivations, his motivations, find out his reasoning behind the choices he's making and the villainous ways that he's gotten into, um, you know, and his, his hatred for, um, for T'Challa and wanting to take down Wakanda or to rule Wakanda because he feels like he's owed it because of what happened with his father and all of that. Um, so that you have much more time to spend with him there to flesh all that out. Whereas here you don't have as much. So he kind of comes off as slightly more one note. And I think maybe that they're hoping that the, I suppose, the, the, the prior knowledge that we have going into from the main timeline will support that and hold it up so we can be like, okay, sure, he's not developed enough here, but we can whistle past it because we know the backstory, we know everything already. So that makes, that makes sense on one, you know, in one way, I suppose, but still, I, he was definitely more of a one note villain in this for me. Um, so yeah, again, I would love more time. 30 minutes is not enough for this kind of stuff that they're doing, not with every episode. The Doctor Strange episode was amazing, um, and 30 minutes was, was just the right amount of time. It worked so well, the pacing was amazing, and it ended where it needed to end, and it was great. And very similar with the T'Challa episode uh, as Star-Lord, that was also very well paced and well-rounded story. But here, it just... There are parts missing, there are pieces missing, it ended abruptly, and it's just, yeah, it just falls short of the expectations that I have for this show, um, which, is, which is a shame to say. But again, like I said, it's still enjoyable. I'm so very much here for these alternate tellings of, um, of these MCU stories that we know so well, and it was so cool to kind of see this episode be like referencing a bunch of different stuff and being kind of a mishmash of Iron Man 1, hints of Iron Man 2, um, Avengers Age of Ultron, and then some Black Panther thrown in for good measure. Like it's, yeah, it's a nice kind of, they've pulled from all these different, you know, all these different trees, all these different apples from these different trees and they're, you know, mixing them together. Um, Cause that's what you do with apples, you mix them. <laughs> Bad metaphor, but anyway, um, I love that. I think that's really cool that they're doing that. Um, and it's interesting to see the kind of path that Tony Stark may have gone down had he lived. Um, uh, well, not had he lived, should I say. <laughs> had he, um, had he not been shot and become Iron Man, had he not been captured by the Ten Rings. Um, you know, so it's, so this is an interesting glimpse into that whilst the event kind of still seems to have some kind of effect on him, but it doesn't really, um, he doesn't seem to change too much and he's very much gun ho pun intended on doubling down on the Jericho manufacturing, um, developing different versions. We even see a portable prototype of the weapon for use, like that's insane. So that stuff never happened, obviously. Um, so Tony, Tony Stark is very much still the billionaire playboy philanthropist, you know, without the, the, you know, straight moral compass now, really. He's still willing to tread in these gray areas. And we also see that when he is like, oh, I know a guy, you know, who's got some vibranium and, and that's when we get, you know, a uh, reunion with Ulysses Claw again, which is great because I'm here for Andy Serkis any time of the week. Um, and to see him come back as Ulysses Claw is just lovely, especially, again, similar to Killmonger um, and Michael B. Jordan. Very happy to see him come back because he was also, uh, you know, killed prematurely in Black Panther. Uh, so that was nice to kind of have that, um, have this kind of weird timeline version of the Age of Ultron scene where they go to his ship um, to get the vibranium. Um, so yeah, um, so yeah, so RDJ, RDJ, well he's not in this, um, <laughs> you know, so I'm getting RDJ and Tony Stark confused. Tony Stark is not the same, uh, same Tony Stark that he becomes, 
because he has not had that life-changing event per se. So um, I really love the fact that um, Obad Obadiah Stane got taken out of the equation straight away because I was watching the press conference and I'm sitting here going, how is this going to play out? Does, does, does Killmonger know that Obadiah was behind it? And, um, and then they, of course, they outed that um, when Killmonger said he was in deep, uh, in deep cover uh, with, the te uh, with the Ten Rings. So, um, yeah, so he found out about the assassination plans and that Obadiah was behind them. So he outed him at the press conference. And, yeah, I thought that was, that was good. I'm like, well, we'll just, all right, dealt with that. Tick. Um, that was good. Um, yeah, what else can I talk about? Well, I suppose I can talk about all the, the, the cast that we have here because we have a great cast. Um, everybody has returned uh, and in a similar situation, well, everybody has returned except for a few that I'll get to. But anyway, similar situation to uh, episode three um, where we had Mark Ruffalo being Bru uh, Bruce Banner, but of the Edward Norton time that Incredible Hulk happened. So here we have uh, Don Cheadle as Rhodey, but at the time when Iron Man 1 happened, so he's not Terrence Howard. Um, so that's that's cool um, that they've also gone that route with that. Makes total sense, of course. Why wouldn't you? Um, so really, really great to see Don Cheadle um, in this episode as Rhodey. Um, absolutely awesome. So yeah, everybody's back. Uh, with the exception of um, uh, our Tony Stark is again voiced by Mick Wingert um, who I think does a fine job like I, I know people are mixed on the you know the on the the actors that they get to step in and do these impressions of of our characters that we know um, so well and have been watching for years and years and years I think he nails the Tony Stark voice really nice uh, I think it's a good substitute. It's not RDJ, and you know it's not RDJ, obviously, but it's very... I think it's, you know, I think it's it's serviceable. It's fine. Um, I f was less positive about um, Beth Hoyt as Pepper Potts. There were moments, little glimpses, where I was like, okay, that sounds like Gwyneth Paltrow, but then mostly I was like... I thought it was... For half a second, I thought it was Lake Bell again, but she was Natasha. Uh, in episode three, and I thought maybe they got her to do Pepper Potts two for one deal, maybe. I don't know, but no, not the case. Um, so I was, yeah, less sold on Beth Hoyt's performance as Pepper Potts, but, um, but you know, she gave it a fair crack, I think. Um, I actually thought that Obadiah Stain was Jeff Bridges at one point, because um, anything's possible with this show, but it's actually an actor named Kiff Vanden Heuvel. Um, what a great name. Um, he did a very good job. Uh, as Obadiah Stane, even though he only has like one or two lines, uh, he knocked it out of the park. I thought he was awesome. Uh, we had Mike McGill as General Rush, uh, Rush, Ross, Ross, General Ross. Uh, <laughs> not, um, not William Hurt, um, but again, similar to um, Kiff Vanden Heuvel, who I just, whose name I just need to say repeatedly, um, did a very good job and sounded almost exactly like William Hurt, um, Mike, Mike McGill did. So yeah, fantastic job there. And I did also enjoy, um, I'm going to, I'm going to try not to butcher the name on this one, but here we go. Ozioma Akaga. Ozioma Akaga. You have a beautiful name and I'm sorry if I pronounced it wrong. Um, she voices Shuri in this episode instead of Letitia Wright, which is interesting not sure why that is. I feel like maybe the main reason that could be, and they can explain it away, is the fact that this is a Shuri that's 10 years younger than when we actually first meet her in Black Panther. Um, because, uh, of course, this these events in this timeline are taking place in 2008. Um, so everyone's a whole lot younger, and uh, that includes Shuri, and then you can obviously tell in the animation she's standing a lot lower when uh, she's standing next to her, her family and, uh, and other people in the scene she's in. So um, I feel like that's probably the main reason they've gone with a different actor, but Letitia Wright probably could have done it. I don't know. Anyway, I definitely know Gwyneth Paltrow wouldn't have voiced Pepper Potts, so I was not surprised to hear someone else doing her voice. <laughs> that did not surprise me at all. Um, no shade on, on Miss Paltrow, but um, not surprised. 
Uh, <laughs> but anyway, apart from that, yeah, well, the voice, the voice cast did a fantastic job, as they have been doing um, throughout this series. Um, I did really like that we got to see another glimpse into Michael B. Jordan's anime obsession um, with his Liberator drones being <laughs> like looking like Gundam mech warriors. Uh, I thought that was very cool. Uh, for those who don't know, Michael B. Jordan is a massive anime fan. Um, he said it in many interviews to the point where um, they based parts of Killmonger's costume off of Vegeta from Dragon Ball Z. Um, they wear very similar chest plates, um, very similar design, and the blue comes from Vegeta as well. So I think that's really cool. So no surprises to see um, <laughs> that Killmonger's uh, design for a weapon is in the, in the form of something anime related. Uh, it looks super badass, super cool. Um, but yeah, I thought that was really nice that they were able to sneak that in there for Michael B. Jordan. It's very cool. Um, yeah, so I guess getting into the nitty gritty of this episode, um, this is the f fourth time now in the MCU we've seen Tony Stark die. <laughs> And I say four with an asterisk because technically we didn't see Tony turn into a zombie last week. We just already saw his undead form, but that still counts. And we did get to see him blowed up or I can't even remember how he died last week now. It's gone from my brain. But, you know, dead. Done. Tony Stark's, yeah, four times. This is the fourth time. Obviously the main timeline, you know, I am Iron Man. Um, and then we have um, in episode three when he, when Hank Pym kills him. And then uh, Zombies last week, and now we have um, uh, Killmonger murdering Tony Stark. So Tony Stark's stands are not doing well. <laughs> when I was scrolling through the interwebs last night after the episode, that was, that was the general reaction. It was just, well, they've killed Tony Stark again. And there was just this plethora of memes about it. I thought it was quite funny. Um, I feel you though, I feel you though, it's sad. It's sad, but, you know, it's not RDJ voicing him, so I'm not as sad as I would be, I think. Um, I am sad about the fact that they killed T'Challa in this episode, but it was really well done. Like, I really liked, I think my favourite part of the episode had to have been um, the Age of Ultron sort of recreation scene where, you know, uh, Rhodey has been sent in as a uh, diplomatic cover so they could get the vibranium from Ulysses Claw. Um... And it's actually for Tony Stark and, and Killmonger and their Liberator um, drones because they need vibranium to power it. Um, so the events of Iron Man 2 obviously never happen. So Tony never invents this element um, that helps power his arc reactor. That doesn't happen. So the drones are powered with vibranium because vibranium is obviously very powerful. Um, so yeah, so they need as much of it as they can get and um yeah they send Rhodey to go get some however um it turns out that Killmonger went behind everyone's backs and uh, made a deal with Ulysses Claw um very similar to the one he made with him in Black Panther um and uh yeah basically all hell kind of breaks loose because um uh, Ulysses leaks to the Wakandans that this deal is taking place and because they're so precious about their vibranium understandably um, they wouldn't want this deal going through so um, yeah so T'Challa arrives to try and stop them as Black Panther of course uh, and then yeah and then Killmonger kills him and I was like oh okay and then he kills Rhodey. And I was like, oh, okay, this, this is this kind of episode. Cool. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, not expecting that. That was pretty dark, actually. Like, really good, but dark. Um, poor Rhodey. That was, that was sad. So then we have, you know, Killmonger has manipulated this entire situation, forced the US and Wakanda into this kind of war now um, because they made it seem that Rhodey killed... Uh, T'Challa uh, and so the Wakandans are out for blood and that's how when Tony ends up finding out uh, what uh, Killmonger did um, with the ability of Jarvis um, he um, yeah ends up dying because Killmonger yeah Kill well Killmonger is like well you can't tell anyone my plans so I'm gonna kill you so he does and um, and that's kind of shitty because I kind of like the bromance they had going on so it's a shame that that didn't last 
Um, but basically he uses a uh, Dora Milaje spear to kill Tony, so therefore um, uh, we think that the Wakandans killed Tony Stark as retaliation for the death of T'Challa. Um, so it's all very sad and complicated, but I really like the way that Killmonger plays this um, kind of strategic maneuvering and manipulation as he rises through the ranks. Um, the one part where it didn't work for me is near the end of the episode where um, he's in Wakanda, you know, he's, he's killed Ulysses Claw, similar to how he does in the Black Panther film and hands, hands him over to the Wakandans. Um, and then, you know, introduces himself as Indijaka and the fact that he's, you know, um, the king's brother's son and he's all this, you know, connected to the royal family. And, um, and yeah, so those events play out similarly, except, of course, uh, T'Chaka is still alive because this is, you know, many years before Civil War. Um, so he's still well alive. And, um, and yeah, so he's still king. So uh, Killmonger does not take the throne. Um, however... You know, he convinces them to, you know, uh, brace for the attack from the Americans and all of the Liberator drones sent by Tony Stark, uh, essentially, in the US Army. Um, and then he lets them inside the walls, uh, like the shield, because once the shield goes back up, it'll sever the, trans the transmission between um, the drones and Jarvis, who is running them. And this happens. Um, you know, and the, the Wakandans have gotten ready for battle, of course, uh, because they're going to, you know, they're going to destroy all the drones anyway. Um, and then they're led by Quinn Ramonda as uh, as their general, which I think is awesome. And I'm wondering what's going on with Okoye here, but she's clearly, maybe because, again, we're 10 years earlier, Ramonda is the head of the Dora Milaje here, um, and Okoye, Okoye is still rising through the ranks, potentially. That would explain that. So, um, so yeah, she looks badass. Um, Angela Bassett returned to voice her as well, which is so cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then we, we get, we think we're going to get no battle and, and King T'Chaka's just like, oh yeah, you know, we're going to have drinks tonight now. This is awesome. Toast to you. Celebration. You were right. Blah, blah, blah. But then Killmonger has this little beacon transmitter thing that he turns on and it reactivates the drones because now they have a signal to respond to um within the shield so and then they start attacking and so then this fight breaks out anyway um and i was just like i get why he's made that decision because he's trying to really go to the nth degree to prove that he's loyal to wakanda that he's a hero in this situation and he can be trusted because he wants to become black panther and eventually king um so because it's not until after this that he becomes black panther so i don't know if that was going to happen anyway but i don't know it just felt like it was you know if you you were right about the, the you know the shield severing the transmission point proven you're the hero anyway why even i mean maybe he just likes chaos i'm sure he likes chaos he's a bad guy he um he probably enjoys some kind of destruction and a chance to kind of really boost his ego by going around taking down drones and helping out the the Wakandan army and the Dora Milaje do the same is you know it's, it's gonna look good to the king why not do it um so that kind of makes sense <coughs> to a degree I just it just felt kind of oh okay you don't have to do this but he's gonna do it anyway whatever um yeah what else should I say about this episode um just looking at my notes, seeing if there's anything I forgot. I think that's pretty much it, really. Um, yeah. I did like a nice little nod to the main timeline, Tony Stark. Because <coughs> um, there's a moment where they're trying to come up with a power source for the drones. And then um, Tony surmises, like, well, not surmises, but he thinks, like, he ponders uh, about a miniature arc reactor. And as he says that, he touches his chest. <laughs> and I'm like, mm, I see what you did there. But then he, and then he's like, ah, oh, forget it. He takes his hand off his chest. Um, so that's, yeah, that was amusing. But um, yeah, 
No, it's, look, it is a fine episode, and I somehow was able to dissect it more than I expected. I did not expect this video to be as long as it is right now. I thought it was going to be, like, less than 20 minutes of me yapping about it, but it's worked out well. Um, so I think that's really it for me on this episode. I hope you guys liked uh, what I had to say. Uh, if I'm right or wrong or whatever, if you have a point that I missed and you want to hear my thoughts, comment below. Um, like this video, share this video if you feel so inclined, um, and subscribe, most importantly of all, um, so you can keep up to date with all the videos that I put out every week um, to do with Marvel. Um, I just dropped a Hawkeye reaction video for the first trailer for Hawkeye, which is awesome. Please go check that out now. Um, and if you've missed all my other What If uh, discussions, they're all on the YouTube channel, so go check them out. Um, and subscribe so you don't miss. Ring the bell. Do the little bell thing. Um, so you don't miss out on all of the rest as they come out. Because we've still got three more episodes of What If to go. Um, and I'm keen as a bean for the rest of them. So um, looking forward to that. But until then, thank you so much for watching. I've been a Kendall Richardson and you've just experienced non-scripted ramblings.